Hello and welcome to today's uh, webinar. This is a presentation from One Voice for Manufacturing um, from NPMA and PMA. This is a Washington DC update. If you are new to these webinars, uh, these are webinars where the on the ground advocacy team for NPMA and PMA gives an update on what's going on from a federal government and policy perspective. Um, on today's webinar, you have me, Caitlin Sickles, a senior principal in the policy resolution group at Bracewell. You normally have my colleague Paul Nathanson as well, but he is on a well-deserved vacation uh, with his family, so he is not on today's webinar, but you do have the team from the Franklin Partnership, um, Omar Nashashibi and John Guzik. Um, if, again, if you're new to these webinars, uh, just a little bit of background here. Uh, the policy resolution group at Bracewell, we do the media relations, um, social media strategy on communication to make sure that small and medium-sized manufacturers have their voices heard on policy issues. And the team at the Franklin Partnership does the on-the-ground lobbying out there advocating for NTMA and PMA members, as well as the entire uh, metal forming, metal working industry. Um, there's lots to cover. I say that every time, but really there is a lot to cover. Uh, I know that we have a full agenda today. In fact, I've been reliably informed that the webinar may run a little over the 30 minute mark and into about 1245 Eastern time. Uh, but let me tell you what we're gonna cover. There's gonna be a conversation on the latest from Congress. I can tell you here in Washington and, and maybe where you are too, everybody is talking about the debt ceiling. Um, so I know we'll have an update there, also on regulations, trade, and, and tariff issues as well. So let me turn it to you, John. Uh, what's going on with the debt ceiling? Tell us about the passage in Congress today. Well, thanks, Caitlin. Um, and for those on the, on the webinar, there's a box in the lower right-hand corner. If you have any questions during the webinar, feel free to interrupt us, and we'll try to answer those questions during that process. Well, that ceiling, as you said, Caitlin, has like sucked the oxygen out of Washington. And as many of you know, saw last night, the Senate passed uh, passed the debt, the House passed debt ceiling with a 69-39 vote. So now it goes on to the president. So we went up to the brink of default, but did not default on our debt. So what is the debt ceiling? It suspends the debt ceiling until January 1 of 2025, puts caps on domestic domestic spending moving forward. Um, and beyond those caps, there'll be a 1% growth rate um, in, in the budgets. However, in the DOD in FY24, they're gonna get, instead of a 1% increase, they're gonna get a 3.3% increase. Um, and keep in mind that you know, it's a basically a two year cap agreement. And then beyond that in years 26 to 29, while there are caps, there it's not, in law, it's just targets that the, the Congress should look to. So in congressional speak, that means they'll be able to blow the caps um, in fiscal years 26 to 29. Uh, it also establishes some appropriations deadlines. So no longer you hear Omar and I talking about continuing resolutions to keep the government funded through January or March of the following year. They have an appropriations deadline in here that if they don't have a, the appropriations bills signed into law by January 1 of that year, there'll be an automatic across the board 1% cut in 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 the budgets. And so I think that's why we're not going to see, it's gonna be unlikely to see continuing resolutions go beyond January 1. Yeah, that was basically intended to be a mutual pack from both sides, uh, particularly because this is how you bring along the defense hawks that we'll get to in a few slides on there, but there was a lot of ways to say, we're not gonna keep doing this again and keep the punting. So the idea is if you can exact enough pain across the board spending cuts, that would be enough to dissuade them from doing that. But the defense talks are still, you know, I mean, are, are still concerned. And there's, I mean, before the bill even gets to the president's desk, they're already talking about in Washington about a, an emergency supplemental spending bill to, to boost defense spending. The bill also claws back the um, Inflation Reduction Act, Inflation Reduction Ask, Act IRS funding. Remember, there's additional funding for IRS. For the IRS, it claws back some of that money. It reprograms and rescinds roughly $30 billion in unspent COVID funds. Um, it expands the work requirements for SNAP, which is food stamps, and TANF, temporary assistance for needy families. 
uh, and it, it ends the pause on student loan repayments moving forward. Um, do, you other, do you want to do permitting, John? Okay, so, and this is something that Senator Joe Manchin from, from West Virginia and many others, quite candidly, were really pushing for is an included permitting reform. Significant changes to the National Environmental Policy Act, also known as NEPA. Now, a single agency can, re can review a permitting application rather than having it punted from agency to agency. They set some timeline uh, limits and page limits for, uh, for those reviews. For example, if you're going to do an environmental assessment, which is a less stringent environmental review, that review must be done in one year, and it's limited. The pages is limited to 75. However, if you're going to do a more complex environmental impact statement, an EIS, the agency is given two years for review. 150 pages is is for a limit of 150 pages. However, it's an if it's an extremely complicated. Um, environmental review, they can go up to 300 pages, and it changes the scope of consideration to, reason, to reasonably foreseeable environmental concerns. Yeah, there's there's some things with regards to this that just did not go far enough. Uh, I know some might consider it significant. Most, I think, say it just nibbled around the edges in some areas. Democrats, in particular, are unhappy that it didn't deal with transmission and speeding the, the review for permitting on the, that side as well. So there still probably is going to be another round with regards to on, on permitting, since certainly did not touch on all of the priorities that those in the environmental business, um, energy rather business want with regards to the environmental and renewables. So Democrats were clearly unhappy and we expect to see something more from on this space in the future. Um, now let's looking at quickly, uh, just a little bit on the analysis here for you all and your planning purposes on what this now really means. No, they did not cut spending. They've just made it appear that they're going to stop spending more uh, or as much as they had desired previously. Note that John's point on January 1st, he said nothing of September 30th and correctly so. This does not prevent a government shutdown. You still are likely facing a government shutdown on October 1st of this year if the sides do not have all 12 of their spending bills signed into law by midnight going into October 1st. So that is still a reality. That threat still looms that's out there, though we do have increased agreement from the appropriations chairs and rankings to try to clear all of those bills through on a more orderly basis than we have in the past. And that's why, at least from a spending standpoint, we at least now have a better timeline that we know by the end of the calendar year, you'll have a better sense of where the FY24 numbers really are. Again, FY24 starts on October 1st. What this means though, if you're involved in workforce development, job training funds, which all of us are directly or indirectly, and if you're a defense contractor or reliant on some kind of government federal procurement or research and even O&M dollars that are out there. What's going to happen on the defense side, we'll start there, is you are now going to have only a 3.3% increase for FY24 and a 1% increase in FY25. Now let's set aside the supplemental for a minute. What this means is that you typically are gonna see lawmakers prioritize procurement projects over research and development and operations and maintenance for the military services. So what you also would then see is some of you are on, let's say, an A-10 or something that the, the services have called for their retirement or phase down of, you're going to be looking at lawmakers saying, where can we spend now the less amount of dollars that we anticipated we would have had just two months ago? Meaning those programs that might be called for retirement or phase down could have, have that happen more quickly, or you may have one fewer aircraft or one fewer of certain type of product that the Defense Department was looking at. So you're going to have a lot more competition. Yes, it is still a plus up and it does equal what President Biden requested, but the defense community was looking at a three to 5% increase, knowing where we are with the rate of inflation. On the domestic side, similar, if you were holding essentially flat for this fifth coming fiscal year 2024, keep in mind, we increased job training dollars in the last Congress by a couple hundred million dollars. That is likely off the table for this coming fiscal fight meaning we've got more challenges. We have to protect the dollars that we succeeded at increasing on all of the workforce apprenticeships and otherwise, and then we're gonna have to convince them for the additional increase that we know that we continuously need. That is on the federal funding side. The other aspect to be concerned about longer term is what's gonna happen on the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. As many of you know, by December 31st, 2025, you're gonna have a number of different provisions that start to expire. Corporate tax rate, individual pass-through, the 199A, a number of different provisions will start to expire. 
Democrats aligning the debt ceiling limit with 2025 and Democrat Republicans as well, that will ultimately be tied into negotiations because the debt limit won't be reached until sometime in February or March 2025. But also keep in mind, this is now leverage for one party or the other, depending on who's in power with regards to all of those business expiring tax revisions. And that's something that you certainly are going to want to watch out for. Again, the president's going to sign this into law and we move on to the next fight, which is really focusing on appropriations and the funding round. Yeah, I, Omar, I agree with you. I think the next fight is going to be over appropriations. But as the debt ceiling has sucked out all the oxygen out of Washington in the last month, it has put off other prior, priorities specifically of House Republicans. And I do think we're going to see an increase in oversight uh, being done by the by, at least by the House Republicans in the Congress. Yeah, and you will have, a, there's going to be a tax proposal that starts to come out hopefully this week later, or maybe next week. You will have something from the House Ways and Means Committee that will include the big three provisions of an RND fix, that's at section uh, 163J fix, and then also reinstating 100% bonus depreciation. We're also hearing that the Republicans would like to double section 179 uh, expensing for small businesses. We did sign on and officially endorse that legislation. Unfortunately, it's Republican only at that time, which means it's tough to get over the finish line. This action, if you do see it coming out in the media next week, it is going to be to set up long-term negotiations with Senate Democrats. We do not expect a tax bill or resolution on R&D and the others until sometime in November, likely the second or third week in December. That's our update from Capitol Hill. Let's jump into a few regulatory items. We are not going to go through the next four slides in detail. It's more for the HR side to know that it is out there. In last month's presentation, we gave you an idea of what the federal government was beginning to do in terms of rolling back the COVID-19 requirements. We gave you information last time on the Department of Labor and some of their new FAQs. Now you are seeing the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission put out their FAQs with regards to the Americans with Disabilities Act. Again, two, three, three years ago, we were going through a number of changes we were putting out throughout that summer every time there was a new update. And this is similar to what you can see here. If an employee calls in sick, how much information may an employer request the employee in order to be able to determine whether or not they should come in? Same thing, question A3, when may an ADA covered employer take the body temperature of employees? I know some of this seems like so two years ago, three years ago, but again, the EEOC just updated. We would suggest that you send these slides, especially along to your HR department, so that way you can have a better sense of what is permitted, what is not permitted, and what the new and latest recommendations are that's on here. We just do have one more, a uh, couple more in here. What may an employer do if under the ADA an employee refuses to permit the employer to take the employee's temperature or refuses to answer questions about whether the employee has COVID-19 symptoms associated or been tested? A lot of this, as you read through it, tends to revert to the way that things were, where you would refer back to your employer manual, you would look at the employee handbook that they, saw, that they signed on their onboarding and their acceptance, and that's what we're seeing increasingly in some of these, not across the board, just a few as well. And you take a look here also, may an employer store an existing medical files information it obtains related to COVID-19. This one is also critical that you keep in mind the existing practices that they must be stored separately from the employee's personnel file as they're considered medical information. Not a change, a clarification and a reminder as well on there and then again, May you screen applicants? Yes, an employer may screen applicants for symptoms after making a conditional job offer. Again, it likely will not be relevant to the vast majority of you all, but in the cases it is, just want to have this out there for your HR folks. John, let's jump a little bit more deeply into the regulatory side now. We do know there's been a lot of talk about non-competes. Uh, this is a separate action than one we've been talking about with the general counsel issuing this memo. John can't hear you if you are still with us. All right, I'll jump in and keep on going. Uh, John, just ping us when you're reconnected again. The NLRB, National Labor Relations Board, has a general counsel that many would argue. You there, John? Nope, you just muted yourself. You unmute yourself, sounds like you're good again. And as you're getting ready to do that, we will just remind folks that the National Labor Relations Board does actually consist of members. Unfortunately for most, the general counsel is actually the most important and powerful person on that. And he or she, in this case, uh, she has the authority on their own to issue an opinion memo that some other agencies, such as the IRS, can do as well. 
in this one as we get ready for John to rejoin us or get off mute. The non-compete agreements do violate the National Labor Relations Act. There's been a lot of discussion about this and also how it could impact not just non-competes, but a pending rule that would eliminate non-competes in general also potentially could affect non-disclosure agreements that many of you all sign with your employees in engineering, sales, and et cetera. So now know that this does have the effect of law. Both associations have access to legal counsel that can certainly provide additional information, but please bear in mind. Sticking with the HR theme again, please, new poster has been updated. This was updated just after our last presentation we gave, so just about in the last 30, 45 days or so. And it, with regards to uh, FILSA, uh, what's going on is there's a section in here. It's on the left side. You'll see pump at work. That is a new paragraph that's been included. Congress updated a law in the last couple of years with this requirement. Note the two requirements here that you face. One, you have to put up the poster. This is updated and you must comply with all other posting rules. Then what does the law actually prescribe for you? Reasonable break time for a nursing employee. Employer, employers must provide a place, and this is very critical, other than a bathroom that is shielded from view and free from intrusion from coworkers in the public, which may be used by the employee to express uh, breast milk. That's something that is also important from the structural, what, you, what positions you have available, what offices you have available, things like that to have in consideration. But first and foremost, note that the new poster is there. Uh, looks like John got his power back and once he's off mute, John looks like you're back with us. Almost. Uh, voluntary protection program update. Uh, we've there's been a lot going on over at OSHA, but John, feel free to interrupt me at any point to let me know you're back. Voluntary protection program update. Uh, what we are seeing, we were on a call with OSHA on the 31st on Wednesday, a couple of days ago, and we heard from the OSHA director himself that what they want to do is really expand uh, the participation of voluntary protection programs. There was concern in this meeting that small businesses would struggle in, or do struggle in some cases with this. There is a stakeholder meeting coming up on June 15th. For those of you that aren't aware of what a VPP is, but essentially if you join in, in, in the voluntary protection program, you work with OSHA, you go through the number of steps, you have that initial inspection, they make sure all your paperwork, your training manuals, everything's up to speed, and then you pretty much go on the cleared list. It doesn't mean they won't show up if there's a complaint. They just think of you as, think of it like the TSA frequent flyer programs. They know that you are cleared for the most part, you are in compliance, and they'll check on you, you know, every once in a while, as opposed to putting you on a more frequent list. So some, that comes with some strings. If you do engage in the VPP, you will have to do everything that OSHA tells you in terms of uh, the part of an OSHA inspection coming through. So that can be a downside. Also on that May 31st meeting, is we had uh, this was a big, large meeting with regards to NACOSH and as a part of OSHA. And again, John, jump in here. So the federal government, as you all are aware, is looking at establishing an indoor and outdoor rule for when the heat index exceeds 80 degrees Fahrenheit. The federal government currently has a national emphasis program, an NEP that's been in effect since April 8th of 2022, which instructs the OSHA inspectors to place a greater emphasis on heat as an injury and illness issue and looking on the wellness and safety of the workplace. OSHA is working on both an indoor and outdoor heat rule, both subject to the 80 degree plus heat index. They are in that process. We don't have a proposed rule. They created a working group uh, with regards to the, the NACOSH, the National Advisory Committee on Safety and Health. NACOSH held their meeting on May 31st to receive two sets of recommendations from a working group that was created last year. One working group completed its efforts in January, late early February, on how to communicate the new rule to employers and to employees. It discusses the different languages that they're gonna to wanna to see translations into. They've got translations based on regional recommendations. So if you have a high concentration of Vietnamese or Polish, then you would want to have a requirement to have the explanation on safety for heat to be done in that language as well. Well, the second working group put together was a potential list of components that could end up in a rule that would regulate the workplace in an indoor situation when we exceeded 80 degrees Fahrenheit. That rule would obviously include having a plan, what to do, training employees for heat, environmental monitoring, and this is not a put up the temperature gauge in one part of the shop. You would have to monitor temperature in multiple areas of the facility, whether loading dock to next to the machine, to obviously the office space and everywhere else. 
workplace control measures. This is where you get into the engineering controls, whether it's a fan, uh, installing HVAC system, something else that would deal with that engineering control. The administrative controls would be on weather acclimatization. I think some of you've heard me say this in the past, they typically wanna see you on board in a third, a third, a third, their first week of work in that heat environment. They work at 30% of their normal shift, 60% the next week, and then they ramp up to 100% as their body adjusts to the additional heat. There was a discussion in the Wednesday meeting with regards to people in the South, not necessarily needing as long of time to acclimatize, uh, be acclimated to these types of weather situations, and that's something to, to watch out for. Obviously, worker participation, best practices, these are a number of lists of what we're seeing and potentially. So next steps for you all, we are still a ways away from this. What we are expecting, yes, we can, John, okay. uh, we've got you back and I'll jump to you here in a minute. Uh, what we are expecting on the next steps here, the advisory commission has officially accepted the task force input from that working group on both of them. They did have a caveat that they would want to have some kind of sample of recommendations put together that maybe can be a little bit better reviewed of what might be expected. Again, small businesses have a big concern here. We work closely with the Small Business Administration's Office of Advocacy. We were on their monthly call last Friday. We spent two hours talking to OSHA and others about this and one other issue. What we're gonna see is what's called a SABRIFA. It's a Small Business Regulatory Enforcement Flexibility Act. A SABRIFA panel is required when it's been deemed that there's a significant impact on small businesses or could be. A SABRIFA panel is impaneled 60 days after the Department of Labor requests it, and then it will take 60 days to actually complete the SABRIFA panel that will receive input. So if you do that 120 days, that puts us on a potential proposed rule, maybe January, February of 24, with final adoption, we believe, to take place in, prior to the completion of the Biden administration's uh, first term. So that's where we stand on that indoor, outdoor heat rule. But Omar, Anybody don't, you, would like don't you agree? I mean, this is such a dramatic change. I mean, and you're gonna talk about California in a second, but this is gonna be litigated. And so while there may be a final rule by January, 2025, I think there'll be some long-term litigation on this. Yeah, the litigation is likely going to be from those that are saying it doesn't go far enough and that I, they're violating my safety. It's going to be difficult for an employer to be able to chart, challenge this in some suit. So in some ways, it's going to the law, lawsuits might actually hurt us more than help us in some cases as we look forward to that. In California, uh, indoor heat rule meeting was on May 18th. Last month's slide deck included a little bit more detail on what that California rule has in there, but just to at least give you an update on where we are since we did attend that meeting as well. And that's a separate effort from the May 31st effort that was going on with regards to OSHA indoor-outdoor. The California rule is only indoor. They already have an outdoor in the slide deck that you can get from Cal OSHA. You can actually see what the difference is between their indoor and outdoor. There's a couple of main differences. One, you talk about shade, that's an outdoor thing indoors it's going to be more on more on the side of a cooling station and that's going to be important as you think about how can i refab the internal spaces in my shop if i am going to be required to create an indoor uh, cooling station and that's something to take a look at the timeline here for cal osha to have their vote in the first quarter is what their staff said told us on may 18th and the goal is to have it take effect by the heat season, which typically means Memorial Day of next year. And one thing before I turn it over to John and talk about some taxes here, uh, on that OSHA meeting, the NACOSH meeting rather on May 31st, those that would like more information, our firm did put out a memo on that yesterday that details and has the subcategories of what might be required for those that would like more information on that, please reach out to us at any any time. Uh, John, now that you're back with us, you want to take some of the IRS bonus tax credits sure. coming from the IRS? Sorry about that. I had a power I had a power surge in my in my house, and so I went out for a few minutes. So sorry about that. Uh, earlier, the IRS is part of the Inflation Reduction Act. The IRS sent out a guidance regarding a uh, provision in the Inflation Redu Inflation Reduction Act on the domestic content credit for for energy for clean energy projects and so it essentially uh, provide the guidance of the, that there is a domestic content credit available for production and investment in clean energy projects moving forward then they came out and said well what is a project a domestic project that is 
manufacture it in the United States, and it clarifies it um, here in, in this next slide, and it's, it's pretty obvious. It's not only if the project is produced in the, in the United States, but also secondarily component parts must be com uh, completed in the, in, the US, in the U.S. to qualify for that credit. Yeah, and you notice how there's different categories here, and that's where the credit comes into play, and how you have the better understanding of which part of that credit and which I would fall in, John, like here in manufacturing product. Yeah. And, and same thing, where they define a manufacturing product is considered to be product in the United States. If all the manufacturing process takes place in the United States and the manufacturing product components are of U.S. origin. So this language is obviously good for us. We've seen this administration tighten up quite a bit on the Buy America language that's out there. And so if you do make a product that falls into this, your customer does rather, there are some actual uh, additional bonus that's up there. This one on 48C is not necessarily directed towards any of our members on, in direct, but you might be manufacturing components for this industry and or might be receiving benefits and uh, through energy sources from it. Se uh, Section 48C was enhanced in the Inflation Reduction Act last year from the Qualifying Advanced Energy Product Credit is the official title. And the IRS just issued its guidance two days ago on Wednesday evening with regards to incentives for clean energy manufacturing and recycling, industrial decarbonization, critical materials processing, refining, uh, refining and recycling. On the industrial decarbonization side, there might be for a few of our members some opportunities there to look at 48C and how the investment tax credit application of up to 30 percent might actually be beneficial, especially when it comes to fuel cells, components, and then the general decarbonization of industry. So we suggest reaching out to your CPAs with regards to how that might be beneficial for you all there. With about the 10, 12 minutes we were going to try to keep this to, John, let's just get into what's going on on the trade side. We had some the House Committee on China did some recommendations. Yes, the House Committee on China has been active. I think they've had four hearings already this year, and they came up with two specific recommendations about the genocide in the Uyghur region of China, and then 10 for Taiwan, which is recommendations on how to better support uh, the, the Taiwanese, the threats from communist China on Taiwan. Some of these recommendations include providing Taiwan more long-range missiles, in increasing the cooperation between the U.S. military and the Taiwanese military, um, in improving the supply chain because there is a there's a vast supply chain difference between Taiwan and the United States and so there were 10 recommendations moving forward they also you know said what the Chinese are doing in, in the Uyghur region of, of China is bad uh, the genocide that they're doing and that the US should should you know should not uh, turn away from the genocide that's taking place and, and, mer and businesses should not be investing or purchasing products from that region of that region of the world yeah absolutely and i think john this is one of those that seems to continue to be getting bipartisan attention up on on capitol hill and no shortage of people to talk about china my biggest my biggest worry is that the chairman of the select china committee who has been very aggressive very active and very bipartisan as you said he's being strongly heavily recruited to run for the united states senate in wisconsin and i'm not going to touch into the senate race but uh if he you know, changes his priorities from China to running a Senate race. I, I, I'm concerned about this China committee because it is so bipartisan right now. Yeah, I think he'll see he'll see this through. Uh, a couple things here as we round it out on chips for those that are involved in this or in that supply chain. There's going to be an advisory committee meeting coming up early on Tuesday. I think is the fifth, and those are they've been doing quite a bit of these to receive uh, public input and then also to give updates to the stakeholders on where they are. Here's a link to where you can register for Tuesday, June 6th, all-day conference, and that is virtual that you can attend. Uh, we get occasional questions, particularly from our regulated community in the DOD space a couple of years ago that's now expanded into general commercialization and uh, of general contractors. Protecting controlled unclassified info, the National Institute for Standards and Technologies, uh, one of the agencies no one ever talks about, but is really, really neat and very, very focused on our, or on manufacturing. They're holding a webinar also on Tuesday. This is at one o'clock Eastern, just an hour. And this is to provide an overview of the changes that NIST is making to their publication 800-171 on how to protect controlled unclassified information in non-federal systems and organizations which is you all, and that gives you a better sense of what they're going to go over, what are some of the draft changes that are in there, what requirements are going to be need to be met 
by you all, uh, what the elimination of some of the distinctions between basic and derived security requirements that are up there, some of your NIST uh, special procedures under 800-553B uh, is also going to be in. Those of you that understand some of the gibberish that I'm rattling off will know that this is significant, that someone from your shops is likely going to have to sit for an hour to at least identify whether or not this will uh, require any changes, especially if it comes down from a prime uh, at some point, that seeing if you have this requirement already in place on the protection of unclassified information. And they do have that, uh, that pro product out there to take a look at. One thing that we worked on earlier in the year was uh, talking, there was an effort made by copper uh, groups out here in DC to try to have it listed as a critical mineral. There's two things. There's the rare elements, rare elements come 17 periodic table. Critical minerals are a government designation. Governments around the world have their own definition of what a critical mineral is. Rare earths are the same everywhere. Critical minerals, in this case, there was an attempt to an effort also by Congress and others to try to have the US Geological Survey list copper as a critical minerals, which would provide additional protections. It did not make it on this round. But John, taking a look at why some of these critical raw materials are so important, we thought this chart was particularly interesting. 80% of the world's magnesium comes from China, not a surprise there. 50% of, of, of lithium comes from Australia. 65% of organic um, com components of precious metals comes from China, Congo. We, that's where we get our cobalt. Uh, rare earth mineral, minerals, as you've talked about, Omar, largely comes from China. And I mean, that just demonstrates the global marketplace that we are working in. And so that when we look at lithium batteries and, and how we're moving to that next generation of, of energy, we need to look at critical minerals. This next slide also shows that the 301 tariffs, I want to touch on that a little bit, how import have had an impact on imports coming into this country. The next, this slide and the next slide shows that imports have, our, our imports from China are down across the board. Yeah, and then same thing when it looks at, there's not going to be a US-China decoupling. That's just not going to happen in the next year or two or really sometime soon economically. But if you do take a look at the impact of the tariffs, you're going to want to look at the red and the blue lines in here. And those are the ones that are subject. List one, two, and three, 6,800 items on the red. Those are 25% tariff rate subject when imported from China. The blue line, list 4A, that's a 7.5% tariff margin. And that is about 3,200 imports coming in from China. And you can see how those levels are lower than the pre-301 section tariffs that were put in place by the previous administration. And our last policy slide, for those that want to put in a question on the right here, we'll get ready to wrap up in a couple of minutes. Please do so. We've got one so far. This slide here represents the U.S. Trade Representative extend its final batches of exclusions that were about to expire on May 15th through September 30th. Most of these are medical COVID-related there are going to be everything from gloves, their goggles, protective gear, disposable beddings, all of those kinds of things. There were 81 total Medicare um, products that were out there. They did allow four of them to expire two days ago on the 31st. The rest are now aligned. Why this is important, even though most of you don't have anything that's on this exclusion list or likely manufacturing a product that is now getting relief from the 25% tariff, is that September 30th date, we already have a few other exclusions expiring. The U.S. Trade Representative is finishing up its one its four-year review of the impact of the 301 tariffs. We suspect we might see a report on what those tariffs did and what they mean sometime this summer, along with a public hearing. And then the U.S. Trade Representative Biden administration might address what their next steps are, whether to keep, to lift, or to keep just some of the tariffs on imports from China, probably sometime in August or September. That's something to watch out for. As always, you can stay connected with us. We record our bi-weekly podcast from One Voice. We get a little bit more political in there and more on the analysis and less just straight talk and straight policy. Please do join us on that. We do appreciate all of those that have donated in the past and continue to do so to allow us to be your voice in Washington, D.C. And with that, we're right just about 1235 Eastern. We do have one question that has come in that will take about a minute or two to explain. And please do others, any questions, please do put them in into the box here. The question came in, if the repeal of the research and development amortization rule does not happen until November or the end of the year, would we file amended returns for 2022? And what is Biden's position on the repeal? Our advice as of right now is to assume you will not get taken care of in 2022. 
uh, what our concern is and has been, the further we got beyond March 31st, the harder it was for us to get retroactivity to January 1st for 2022. Lawmakers, very, I mean, Republican we were with the other day, not a bomb thrower, was a real legislator, just shook his head and said, just don't see 2022 happening. Now, not a tax writer, off of committee. So, but that just tells you we've had an uphill fight. I think once we're in November, December, it's gonna be extremely complicated if you have a gap year where 2022 is not made whole, but we're not getting the warmest of feelings on it. It is still a top priority to make it happen, but we tend to be very, very cautious when it comes to a tax bill. And we would strongly suggest that you all look at different opportunities and options with regards to protecting yourself in case they do not make you whole for 2022. And again, you won't know this until later on. The R&D fix under Section 174, you all are aware by now that you must amortize over five years and capitalize your R&D assets. You can no longer immediately expense them in the year in which they occurred. What they're talking about doing is giving you all of 23, 24, and through December 31st of 2025 to align it with the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. Now, does that include 2022? We are trying to do that. It's unsure. So whether or not you file an amended return will also depend on whether or not Congress makes you whole for 2022. If I had to give you a number, I'd tell you you're at about a 20% chance, 25% chance of getting 2022 in there right now. It's, With it's, regards it's, to Biden, it's, it's very popular, Omar. The R and D strongly no, bipartisan. It's not. No, 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 we're talking about 2022 specifically. The position on people on Capitol it, Hill it, it, is going to be that you were already incentivized to take an action that you already did, and therefore this is doing nothing to incentivize you to do more on the books. And our argument is, what you're doing is taking money away from 2024 investments that should be taken now, just as they took 23 from 22. I agree, but in the end, it's a numbers game. It costs more money to retroactive to 2022. Yeah. Uh, one other comment we received, it looks like all imports from China, whether tariffed or not, could you conclude that something else caused the decrease in tariff products? When you look at it around, I mean, if you look at it from a subjective standpoint, tariffs from China continued. Tariffs into the United States increased. The tariffs did not reduce imports into the United States. That is not a thing, no one can claim that because you did have an increase in imports from across the world coming in. Those from China did see in some categories, sub subcategories really, when you look at one, two, three, break those down, you did actually see some imports increase of those that were subject to tariffs. But overall, there was a slight downtick, not very much, but there was a slight downtick for the section 301. It's very difficult for anyone to credibly be able to say what the 301 did across the board, across all sectors, because it certainly did not change the overall way that uh, that imports are moving. But when you get into specific products, whether it's tooling, dyes, stampings, then they did have an outside outside impact versus some other sectors that are out there. Any other questions? Anybody that wants more information on that? I know this group is not supportive of the tariffs, but the Peterson Institute for International Economics, Chad Bound there does great work. All sides, I uh, forgot his analysis, at least he collects a lot of good numbers. So go on to PIIE and type in Chad Bound, B-O-W-N, and you will find a great wealth of information if you want to learn more on Section 301 tariffs. Sorry, we ran a little bit long. We did want to cover, uh, John did a great job of laying out on the debt ceiling, what's out there. As always, please feel free to reach out to us with any questions that you may have. Both NTMA and PMA will make this webinar available. We'll send out the slide deck and we'll also include a link to be able to access the memorandum we put out on the NACOS sheet rule the other day. Thank you for joining us today. We will talk to you in about a month.